As you can tell from my adult appearance, I am of a certain age. I was born in the early 1970s, and while that might make me a child of the 70s, I sort of think of myself as a child of the 80s, because that's when I was a teenager. Uh, I can remember more of that, apart from anything else. And there were lots of exciting things happening in the 80s. Uh, computers, so somewhere in the background, there's a ZX Spectrum, I think it's up there, um, which were things I was always into, but always liked synth pop and synthesizers etc which probably explains what i'm doing now for a living probably the most important synthesizer cue the comments i think in the 1980s was the yamaha dx7 it transformed the way that sound could be generated generating it in a completely different way and its sound was spread across much of the early to mid 80s uh it was notoriously unfriendly so the preset sounds were the kind of things you would hear on many people's records and it still defines that era for many people one of the few advantages of getting older is that you can finally afford the things which you lusted after when you were a teenager which probably explains why people have collections of guitars etc uh, I certainly used to have a large synth collection in the 90s. I don't anymore because I saw the sort of synthesis on computers wave coming and felt it was time to to sell all of those. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the massive rack of synths that I made a, a metal frame for, etc. But this week, uh, by way of introduction, I've managed to buy not a DX7 because uh, that would have been too straightforward, but very cheap on Gumtree, which is a bit of a theme for me. I've managed to buy a Yamaha DX9, the, the weird uh, poor cousin of the DX7. Uh, it doesn't currently work properly. It's a bit crazy. And it's also massively heavy, which is why I probably struggle a bit lifting it up. But here it is. I've managed to buy the most maligned of all the FM synthesizers. And in this video, I'm going to hopefully get it going and then maybe compare it to a software version of the same synth and see whether it was actually worthwhile me breaking my back and standing out in a cold garage uh, in the middle of nowhere playing it through a guitar amp <laughs> in a guy's garage while finding out it was completely mad. Um, yeah, anyway, let's have a look at what's wrong with it and hopefully we'll be able to fix it. So here we have the Mighty Beast plugged in. And when I went to audition it, this is what I was getting. Now, yeah, not much. So changing sounds. Yeah, just sort of wacky. All over the place. Every single sound. That's actually more intelligible than it was. I wasn't even getting this much um, this much sanity out of it, but it's it's quite crazy. And if you try and edit anything, so if I press edit and then pick something to edit, such as portmanteau time. Oh feedback and so on then I'm, I'm just getting nothing sensible from the slider so it just it won't go all the way down etc so i think that probably needs replacing but it doesn't it doesn't make much sense anyway all of the sounds are strange if you do anything sane to it it then does something crazy in a minute so it's just It wasn't this sane at any point, so nearly every sound was just, even the lowest notes were very high. Absolutely crazy. Now, I did a bit of looking. So the absolutely excellent Yamaha DX9.com site, which has got a huge amount of information. It's a really nicely done site and there's loads of information. Basically everything I know about the DX9 has pretty much come from that site. 
tells you something to look for, which is the battery voltage. So you press function and then press 19 until you get to this point where you see the battery voltage. Now that is apparently too high. The battery needs replacing and this can cause all sorts of uh, bizarre behavior apparently. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to uh, take it apart and replace it. Now the, the DX9 site says to just solder on a 2032, a couple of wires and just tape in a 2032. I, for my sins, I uh, did an apprenticeship in the nuclear industry when I left school. So I'm a bit, uh, a certain way about doing jobs. So I'm going to do it what I would consider properly by replacing it with a 2032 holder and putting a battery in. So then in the future, whoever's crazy enough to buy this from me in 10 years time, they'll be able to replace it really, really easily. So let's open up the synth and take a look at what's inside. can really feel the heat inside there. So this is a uh, pretty old school, pretty inefficient uh, power supply design. And as a result, that was pretty warm. So here's the battery in question and it's, it's pretty swollen. So that definitely needs to be replaced. Now it's a lot more work to remove this board. So this motherboard needs to come out, but I'd rather do the job properly. I will probably live to regret wanting to do the job properly, but there we go. Hopefully it should just be a case of undo these connectors and then pop the board out. But often there's things in the way that you don't realize are going to be in the way, but I say, hopefully I will not live to regret these. Well, no, I'll live to not regret these words rather than the other way around. That wouldn't have been good. Anyway, here goes. Well, that was nowhere near as difficult as I thought it was going to be. It actually just basically everything unplugged, it all unscrewed. Uh, a great reminder of an era when manufacturing wasn't cynically designed to stitch you up and make you have either factory workshop manuals or destroy it when you take it apart and put the wrong screw in the wrong place. How lovely. Right, now let's get this battery out. So there's the battery and you can see it's got the little plus marking on the top and you probably see how convex it is, how swollen. So yeah, definitely needs to come out and hopefully it won't explode when we do that. Right, so that's the old battery out and it didn't blow up, which is nice. And it wasn't the end of the world as well because a lot of modern circuit boards, they've got big ground planes on them and you have to really put a lot of heat into them, but that wasn't the case here. Now you hopefully see how swollen this is now. Yeah, it looks more swollen in person than it does on camera, but you can see like this this side of it is particularly swollen, so it's it's not happy. So let's get the holder in now.
So unfortunately, the pins on the battery holder didn't line up with the holes in the circuit board. So I had to bend them in a bit, which mean you lose some of the length. So I'm just going to check it with a meter just to make sure there is a good electrical connection. It seems to be physically there, but just want to make sure before putting it all back together. And that all seems to be fine, which is uh, good news. So now let's get the board back in, reconnected, and see if it's made any difference. Well, that all went totally straightforward, which is nice. It's just a joy to work on. It really is. It's like they designed it to be uh, serviceable. Imagine that. Now, just going to put in a new 2032 battery, and then hopefully it'll power up and be a happy bunny. So, if we press the key, we can hear it's still crazy. Um, the LFO speed on this particular patch is is insane and I've got the fader all the way down now it does seem to be working slightly better because previously it would totally override what I was doing and now it's it's not doing that so much and the manual sort of override with the buttons actually works because previously it was resending that value out now if we reset this patch so I can use function and then we see the battery voltage is 3.2, so that's good news. But let's go to voice in it and do yes. And yes, I'm sure. Right, so that's your basic sort of sine wave patch, which is quite nice. Now I'm going to try and store that as patch two. You press memory select, store, and then the patch you want. So that should be stored as number two. So one should be crazy and two should be boring. So that is an improvement because it wasn't doing that before. It was just completely crazy. Whether or not those will survive being turned off, we will see. But the next bit of experimentation to do with this is to get the audio of factory patches. So they are, were available on cassette because this was one of the ways they cut down the DX9. So it didn't have cartridge storage. It had cassette storage, which was very sort of 1980s home computer vibe. And those files are available on the DX9 site amongst other places as FLAC files, which you can play into the DX9 to load sounds up. So that's what's going to be in S1E2 of the Yamaha DX9 Chronicles. Hopefully you found this video interesting and well done if you've made it this far. If you've learned anything, it's maybe that synths used to be a lot heavier, a lot easier to service, and also that occasionally it is worth risking your life to meet somebody in the dark, in a garage, to buy something off of Gumtree. We'll see you again soon.